Amen. Well, guys, I'm so glad to be with y'all. My name is Ricky, and I'm the student's pastor here at Grace. If we've never met, love to meet you. Just somehow, just say what's up. Uh, but we are going to finish up our series, Coasting. If you haven't uh, been around, this is a, a three-week series uh, that we've been doing. And uh, first week, a couple weeks ago, Josh started. And in this, this series, we've been talking about this picture of sanctification in our lives, the process that Jesus takes us through where he changes us, right? He takes away the old and puts on the new within us, around us. All, everything about us becomes more like him. And it's all through his work, through his love, through his grace in our hearts and in our lives. Uh, and so Josh, started this series off, and a couple weeks ago, we had a, uh, an amazing service, a rededication Sunday with, with our three services that Sunday, and God was here, and man, God moved in a crazy cool way. He's always with us, but he, he, we watched God visibly move in such cool ways in people's hearts and lives, mine included. It was such a great Sunday, and then last Sunday, another great one where uh, Josh jumped in, and uh, he talked about the love of God. And the importance of, of that as a foundation for, for how we walk this relationship out, how we are disciples of the Lord and how we're to walk in his love, to receive his love for us, and then to reciprocate that to those around us. Amen. And so today I want to continue this and, like I said, finish up this series. And I want to talk about one more thing, uh, one more key aspect of this, uh, this walk, this, sanctifica- this sanctification process in our lives that I think is so important to us. Uh, and I want, to, I want to hang out with a, with a guy named Paul today. Everybody say, Paul. Paul is present today, okay? We're going to hang out with Paul. Uh, And we're going to look at a letter that he writes to a guy named Timothy. Uh, And in this letter, Paul says something that I believe is so important for us. He sets a goal for us. Uh, And so this is going to come from uh, from 2 Timothy. I'm going to read the the passage here in a second. But just to give you some background, if you don't know how these two uh, know each other, what this passage is about, uh, the Apostle Paul is like the dude the champ, right? He's gone around and done a ton of things for the kingdom of God. uh, And he has Timothy, who he is basically mentoring and teaching uh, his way to, and he writes this letter uh, in 2 Timothy to him, and what he's doing to Timothy, Paul does to Timothy, and he's, he's encouraging him, and he's also challenging him in, in the purpose that God has placed on Timothy to lead God's people, to build the church, to build the kingdom, bring it here, and he says in verse 5 of 2 Timothy 4, I don't have it up here, but he says, fully carry out the ministry God has given you, right? So he encourages him and he challenges him and says, don't forget to keep moving forward in the plan that God has laid, the path that God has laid before you. And after he says that to Timothy, he takes a moment, Paul does, and he starts to discuss where he's at. And he discusses himself. And here's what he says uh, in 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8. He says, as for me, my life has, been, has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, I love that, that name for God, for Jesus, right? The, the righteous judge will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. So Paul takes this moment and he, he, you know, he expresses the hope and the picture for all of us. But he takes a moment and he talks about his own journey with Jesus, right? He says, hey, Timothy, I want to, you know, like, as for me, I'm going to be honest I'm probably about to die. And you're like, if you're Timothy, you're like, whoa, you know what I mean? What are you talking about? This is the guy who's been in prison before, right? And in prison, him and his buddy are sitting there and they decide to sing praises to God like we just did and the doors fly off the hinges, right? Like, and they're free and, 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 and the guard is led to Jesus and all kinds of crazy stuff. So when he writes this, if you're reading it, you're like, hold on, Paul, what? What's going on here, man? Like, what's different about this time and that time? Because there is something else going on in Paul, right? He's saying things like, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful and the prize awaits me. This is wild to me. Paul knows of what's coming. He knows that he's not gonna get out of this prison, that he's gonna go be with the Lord, that he's done on this small piece of eternity that is our life here on earth. And he's going on to the next thing to be with God forever. He's on death row and yet he has confidence in the Lord, right? He's got this crazy confidence and and this excitement and this comfort in the space that he's in. It's like he's rejoicing of what is to come. Now, I don't know about y'all, but when I read that and and if I try to place myself in Paul's shoes, my letter to Timothy would have looked a lot different, right? Like, hey, yo, Tim, uh, they got me again. Bring some olive oil and a crowbar. We can get out this place. You know what I mean? Like, Like trying to make a way out, like, hold on, man, this can't be it, right? But that's not what he's doing here. What is Paul doing? Paul is setting the goal. Paul is setting the goal for all of us. 
Because I don't know if you know this or if you believe this, but that phrase, the, the, the statements that Paul just made, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have remained faithful and the prize awaits me. We are all called to get to a place like that. Amen. Every single one of us. It's not just like, oh, maybe me, maybe then. No, no, no. We are all called to get to a place where we go, in, re- in regards to my relationship with Jesus, I have obeyed, I have followed, I have finished the race, I've fought the fight, the good fight, and I have done it. It's a calling that God has placed on all of us to get to that day, right? So again, week one, Josh talked about this and he said, we're totally free, right? We rededicated and we gave our hearts to Jesus. And for some of us, we we let Jesus be the Lord. It's the first time, it was was the, the one and only time, the big step that we took to make Jesus Lord of our lives. And we became totally free in Jesus' name. And then the second week, we, we talked about total love and how God's total love, again, it, it, it leads the way. It is the foundation of it all. And this week, what Paul starts to open the door on is this picture of total fulfillment in Jesus. That at the end of the days, of my days, of our days here on this earth, there's a place where we will get to that is totally complete, totally fulfilled, Right? So Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has a purpose and a plan for our lives. Every single one of us, in an individual way, in an individual relationship with them, he says, I've laid this out for you. Before the beginning of time, I knew what I was going to do in you, through you, with you, in this earth, in this life that I have blessed you with. Right? And the hope of this purpose is that we would truly follow Jesus truly follow him. We would know him. We would do whatever he calls us to do. We would step into whatever ministry he calls us to step into. We would surrender all to him. We would live the life his way, the life that he has for us, our purpose, until the very end of our days on this earth, where then he will bring everything to completion and total fulfillment. And so let me just clarify on this as well. We hear that, and I think sometimes we think uh, eternity, right? We think of eternity with Jesus, and that's so true. The book of Revelation tells us that God's going to bring us to completion, and he's going to wipe away every tear, every sorrow, all of that, right? We will be completely healed and restored in Jesus' name when we go and spend eternity with him, right? Paul references this in the book of Philippians, Philippians 1, 4 through 6. And all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus, right? Until the day of Christ Jesus, until we're with him forever and he makes us perfect, right? So there's a picture of eternity there, but I believe what Paul's saying here and what he's saying in this moment, his letter to Timothy is, hey, there's, 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 I'm standing in this place of completion right now. Not perfection, but I've hit the end of my race. I've hit the end of my life and I'm at this place where I can say with confidence, I've done it. And I can look forward now to the prize, the crown of righteousness, the perfection that Jesus has to offer me. But right now in this life that God has given me, I've done a good job, right? Through his grace, through his glory, through his might, I've done a good job. I've followed him and carried out the ministry and the purpose that God has called me to. We are all called to that. Moment of honesty, okay? Because when I read this and when I hear that, when, I, when somebody tells me you're called to do that, I get intimidated. Seriously, right? It's like, I, I gotta, you want me to be like Paul, right? You're talking about the guy, the apostle Paul, who had this crazy moment where he went blind on the road to Damascus with Jesus. And you know, it's like, you want me to be like, you want me to be the guy who goes and plants churches on every corner? You want me to be the guy who writes just about half, if not more of the New Testament? You want me to be that guy? It's like, that, I, that's Paul, man. You want me to be like Paul? That kind of situation, somebody getting to the end of their road and saying, I fought the good fight, I've won the race, those words are reserved for Paul. Okay, Pastor Ricky, right? It's how it feels sometimes. It's intimidating. It's hard to believe that I too could get to a day where I would say those words in confidence because of what God has used me to do, what God has done through me and in me in this life. There's an internal struggle, right? Like, I don't know if, like, I'm fighting. (laughs) I don't know if it's necessarily a good fight. You know what I mean? I'm losing a little bit, but I'm fighting. I don't know if I can be like Paul. Why is that? Why is it hard for us to to really lean into that, to accept that, to, to be true that we are called and it is doable for us to get to that place because we believe lies, right? How many other ideas come in and out of our minds on a daily basis that are counter to what God has called us to or what God says is truth? all the time, right? All the time. In this section, this area of our life, in the end to say, I've done it. I fought the good fight. It's just the same. 
Let's think about these lies for a second. Let's talk about them. What are some of these lies? What do they look like in my life and in our lives, right? The lies that we believe. Number one, I don't qualify. When it comes to being that person that God can use and I can hit the end like Paul, again, I'm not Paul. I don't qualify for that. Why not? Number one, my mess is way too major. I am such a mess, right? Me too. Amen. Heard that, right? I have so much sin and brokenness and I'll be real. I've got these addictions I'm still struggling with and, and, it's just like, and I'm giving it to the Lord, but it's still there. And I just, I don't see myself being able to completely get to a place because if that's still there, how can I get to a place where I'm going to go, I've done it. I fought the good fight. I don't know if there's enough time for me to get to that place, right? My mess is too big. It's too broken. And we forget how big God is and how good God is, right? Or maybe it's, I'm not qualified, right? I don't qualify for this kind of thing because they say so. And they is every other voice but the voice of Jesus, right? Yep. Ah, you probably, this is kind of a weak spot for you. I don't know if you're gonna be able to, right? You've, you've done okay. You could have done better, right? And there's reality, there's room for growth. But this is who I think you are. This is who I say you are. Who does the enemy say I am? Who's the enemy say, yeah, you're probably not gonna be able to get there, man. This thing you're struggling with, it's just too big of a thing. It's, you probably won't get free from it. You'll probably die with it. So all these, like every other voice except for Jesus's voice that holds us back and says, I don't know if you qualify for that. I don't know if you're able or going to be able to get to a spot like that. And again, there's the misconception in our mind. It must be based on my ability and not God's. I don't qualify. What about the second lie? And the second lie is, is actually on the opposite end of the pen, pendulum because if you know human beings, we like to either go all the way over here or all the way over here with our brokenness, right? It's gotta be one or the other. No such thing as here. So the other side of that is it's like, hey, I'm not really concerned about my brokenness. I think, I, I think I'm, I'm in a good spot. Like I've, I've lived life and I've surrendered to the Lord and I trust the Lord, but we go so far to say, I think I've done enough actually. Come on. I forgot. None of us struggle with pride, you know, <laughs> right? But we go to this place and we're like, ah, you know, I've lived a good life. You want to learn how to do this right for Jesus? Let me, I'll tell you, because I've done it. I've been there, done that. So now I'm just going to let you know how to do it. You know what I mean? I set the example for other people. I've done it, right? Maybe you're not as boastful as that, but it's this picture in our mind of, I think I might be, have, I've done it. And so now I'm just going to chill until the Lord comes back, Right? Makes me think of King David, okay? If you, there's this moment uh, in 2 Samuel that we're gonna read from uh, where King David does something, and I'll just let you know in advance, has to do with a wound bathing, okay? So just if you never heard this story, you're just a shocker. 2 Samuel 11, verse one, it says, in the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. So interesting that two times in those, or in that one verse, not those two verses, in that one verse, that it is reminded, we're reminded of the fact that David stayed behind, right? In the spring of the year, when kings normally go to war, David did not. He sent somebody else, right? However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. So what I see here is this, this picture that's being painted is, if you don't know how the story that goes on, David stays behind, and after, while he's stayed behind, he decides to take a rooftop stroll on his palace, and he decides to look at a woman who's bathing, and it goes on and on from there to where he takes this woman, he sleeps with her, he makes her his own, he, she, he kills her husband. Like, it goes on and on and on, folks, and David gets deep into sin, right? Almost to the point until uh, one of his good friends comes by and, and lets him know, holds him accountable, right, that he was like kind of sweeping under the rug, so what does all, ha all that have to do with this picture of like swinging far the other side, I've done enough. David is the man after God's own heart, right? Scripture refers to him as that. David's done great things. He's a mighty warrior for God, awesome things. David, if he wanted to lean into it in his humanity, could go, I've done a lot, right? I've fought a good fight, man. You know who Goliath was, right? It's like, I've, I've done some good things, man, for the Lord, right? So maybe I could sit around and not go to war this time. Maybe I'll hang back this time. Even though it's normally what I'm supposed to be doing and God might be calling me to this, I feel like I've, maybe not this time, Lord, right? And what does that lead to? This is real for us too, right? And I'm not saying that's a guaranteed thing, that that's exactly what's gonna play out for us, but there's some heavy evidence, not only with David, but I think in so many of our lives, where maybe we were called to be doing something by the Lord and we decided, I've, this time I'm going to hold back, God. This time I'm going to step in, maybe do, run my own lane, do my own thing. I feel like I maybe have done enough, right? Maybe as a parent, God, ah, yeah, yeah, my kids, yeah, maybe I've done enough, Lord. Is there room for, ah, 
I raised them. They're living, right? God, I, I feel like I've done enough here. There's so many things that we could place that in, but specifically in our walk with Jesus, maybe I've done enough. So what's the real issue with David? He got complacent. He got comfortable with where he was at. He, he, his, his focus is on what he has achieved and not the fact that when there is breath in our lungs and a pulse in our heart, that God might have more for me. I stop asking God, what do you have for me? And I start asking myself, what do I want to do? Right? What do you have for me, Lord? I'm, I'm still breathing. It's another day. What do you have for me? I've done enough. How can I continue to serve you, my king, instead? Right? So those are our lies. And again, I think there's tons of other ones in the midst of that. Some that you may have in your heart right now. Things that have, have, have made it difficult for you to work towards this relationship with Lord and it being something that we remain in, that we pursue it being the goal and being able to get to that place, things that we feel have disqualified us from being able to get to a place down the road like Paul says he's at. So what's the actual point of all of this, okay? What is Paul really getting at? What is he doing for me? I believe that he is calling us to something. And here's, here's what it is, Hebrews 12, one and two. It says, therefore, since we are surrendered by such a, sur- excuse me, surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. So what is Paul really calling us to here in this walk with Jesus? Jesus does the work within us, right? Jesus is the reason that we can keep moving forward and the reason for the season, amen. But we can keep moving forward, right? But what is he calling us to? I believe he's calling us to endure endure, right? Like he says right here, just right there. Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Let us endure in this life. Let us endure as we journey forward in becoming more like Jesus. Let us endure as we jump into the ministry, the ministries that God calls us to. Let us endure as we walk forward in the purpose that God has laid out from the very beginning. Because as we follow Jesus, as I follow Jesus, there will be many circumstances, voices, sin, decisions, lies, opinions, ideas, and so many other things that will attempt to separate me, separate us from the path path and the purpose that God has for me. So many things. And so God is saying, you've got to endure. You've got to stay on this path. A A better way to say it is you've got to stay in it. This walk with Jesus, the purpose and plan he's called me to, I've got to stay in it. It's important to keep going forward, right? Because there's so many things that will, will attempt to keep us from the moment at the end where Paul finds himself saying, you can't be in that spot. You won't be in that spot. And God's saying, endure, because I've called you to that spot. Stay in it. Finish the race. Fight the good fight. We're all called to do it. So my daughter, Ellie, um, she just got done playing soccer. This is one of, I think it's her third or second season playing. And, and she liked it this year. She didn't know if she wanted to play, but she liked it. It's so funny, man. At all the games, like, for, like her coach would put her uh, at the, uh, uh, as goalie for a lot of the games. And Ellie, you know, if like the ball is in the other half of the field, she's just like, nah, 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 nah. and I'm like, Ellie, because the ball's coming. She's like, let's go. You know what I mean? It's just like a fast shift, but she just dancing, having a good time. She ended up loving the whole season and had fun. But there was one game that we were at and uh, Rach and I were, you know, watching the game. We kind of were walking around the field, just watching as we walk and talking and uh, we, maybe bad parenting moment. We're like kind of getting to this deep conversation real quick. And then all of a sudden we hear crying and a coach is like, your daughter's got hit in the face with the ball. And I'm like, oh, you know, so we run over, check on Ellie and she's really upset. And she's like, I don't want to play anymore. You know, and she's like, I'm done. I'll just put me on the sideline. And so we go to the sideline, we're talking to her, making sure she's good. And we're sitting there and, you know, as we're trying to comfort her and be like, okay, you're good. Like everything's fine. Like there's no blood, you know what I mean? Like everything's good. Um, and she's like, I don't want to play. I just want to be done. She keeps saying like, okay, I understand. I'm sorry that it hurts, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I think you should get back out there. I think you should, you should get back out there because I think you're going to do a great job. And I think you're going to be all right. I know it hurts, but I bet the moment you step back out there, you're going to have a blast and you're going to realize that it doesn't hurt as bad as you think, right? So we're like, come on, you can do this. Eventually it kind of went by the, like, we had her sit down. It's like, think on it, just sit there. And we told the coach, we're like, put her in. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you got it. So <clears throat> we walk away and, and Ellie gets back in and she goes and plays. And at first she's like, oh. And then she ends up stopping a few goals and she's back to, yeah, you know what I mean? She's going crazy. <laughs> But is that not a picture of it for us? Stay in it. It sounds simple, guys, but how many times do we not? And do we decide that's too much? I'm not good enough. 
Maybe I've done enough. Whatever reason we want to bring forth and, 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 and put in comparison to what God is calling us to or say is bigger than what he's calling us to, and we don't stay in it. But we're called to stay in it. Let me give you a quote from an amazing theologian. It goes by the name of Rocky Balboa. He says, it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward, how much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Amen, right? That's not scripture, okay? (laughs) But there's some truth in there, right? There will be bumps. There will be bruises. There will be hard circumstances, situations, seasons of life, and we're gonna wanna quit. We're gonna wanna say, God, this ministry is a lot. And and hear me out, I'll say this. Like, I I understand that we need rest, amen? We need moments of just, we we need to rely on God. There's times that we're not supposed to move forward in things that God may call us to other things, all kinds of things in that. I'm not saying push forward and grind until, you know, the the wheels fall off. That's God's work. We're following God and his leading. He does the work. We can rest in that. But we are called to move with him. We are called to step into what he is doing and we're called to stay in it. And the road will get bumpy. Sometimes those bumps are caused by us, by our own choices, our own sins. And the good thing is we have a God who is a God of grace and he says, yeah, that wasn't it. Get back up. Let's keep going. I've got more for you. I love you. You're forgiven. Let's keep moving. Let's get better. Stay in it, right? Our God is a God of grace. And by the grace of God, this life, this journey, this ministry, this purpose that he's given us is doable, right? So here's what I want to do. We talked about the lies and the struggles and and what keeps us from from being able to stay in it, but I want to remind us of some truth, okay? Because again, this whole series has been about what it looks like to, to really enter into this relationship with Jesus and truly follow him and let him change us all the way down until we get to the place where Paul's at. And we're knocking on death's door and we're saying, hey, we're here, but I'm, I'm rejoicing because of Jesus, right? And I've, I've lived this life for him. I've fought the fight. I've fought the good fight. I've ran the race. I've kept the faith. So what can help us in this? I want to give us four truths about our Lord, about our God that I believe can help us as we continue this journey forever, right? The first truth is that God is faithful. Number one, God is faithful. 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13 says, this is a trustworthy saying, if we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure hardship, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, listen to this, he remains faithful Amen. for he cannot deny who he is. This, that, 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 that little passage right there is so powerful, right? Because you almost got like cause and effect of our choices and what we decide to do with the Lord, right? If we die with him, he'll bring new life. He gives us life. We get to live with him for eternity. If we lie to ourselves and, and, and we choose his way, if we endure hardship, we'll reign with him. He's gonna give us strength. He's gonna give us stuff so that we can be with him forever and reign with him. If we deny him on the other hand and we say no to Jesus, he also will say, I never knew you. There was no relationship, right? Does that, does that mean that God stopped loving us? Never, right? But he's not a forceful God. He's a kind and caring God. He says, it's your choice. And if you choose to deny, then I understand, but I will also say, I never knew you, right? There's that cause and effect. But this last one, if we are unfaithful, is counter, right? The upside down kingdom. If I am unfaithful, because there are times where I will be unfaithful in my walk with the Lord, he remains faithful. Amen. He cannot deny who he is. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is faithful. It is the character, the nature of God, not just an aspect, it is who he is. His promises always hold true. They hold true even when ours don't. Again, as followers of Jesus, we will fall and we will fail in our faithfulness to God. There will be seasons, right? There will be moments. We will sin, we will come up short. Some will even completely deny faith in Jesus Christ and turn away from faith in Jesus. But none of our denials, and don't miss this, none of our faithlessness in seasons or as a whole will impact who God is. It will not impact how faithful he remains. God does not need us to be faithful to him in order for him to be faithful to us. Does that make sense? God's faith, faithfulness is not attached to how faithful we are to him or not. He is our sovereign God, and he is always faithful. And his love for us always endures. He will never change. This is great news, church, right? We should be pumped about this, especially in this situation that we're talking about, right? Because this means that God's love, his grace, his desire, his desire to see us restored and hit that place at the end where we're like Paul and saying, I've done it, Lord. He's like, yep, and I can't wait to help you every step of the way and give you all that you need, right? He's hopeful for us, always. It's a picture of the prodigal walking away and he's like, it's a moment of faithlessness, right? Being unfaithful to the Lord and choosing our own way, saying, I'm, this is what I feel like is right. I'm gonna do this thing. God's like, that's all right. I'll be waiting with a ring and a robe for you to come back. 
right? He remains faithful, not impacted by the choices that we make. Does his heart break for us? Yes. Does he want better for us? Yes. And when we give him the reins, when we give him the throne of our hearts and we're allowing him to sanctify us, is he going to bring change that he knows we need? Absolutely. But he will always remain faithful. He will always be the same. So in this journey that we're talking about today and getting down this road to the place that Paul's at, I want to remind us of something that I think is so important, and that is to remember, to be reminded of God's faithfulness in our past, okay? Specifically, look at the moments of your life where God has been faithful. Another way to say this is it's important for us to build altars of God's faithfulness in our lives. So the book of Joshua, chapters 3 and 4, God is, is giving Joshua authority uh, to lead Israel, and uh, they have to cross the Jordan, right? And uh, they come to this place, and they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and they're like, there's some water, you know, <laughs> got to get across it. And they're like, how's this going to work? And God says, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to split it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that you guys can walk across the Jordan River dry ground. You're going to walk across dry ground. It's a promise for me, okay? The moment that the priests were holding the ark, their feet hit the water, it's going to split, and all of my people will cross on dry ground. Joshua's like, all right, right? It's like, that's a, this sounds a little sketch, Lord, you know? But God does what he always can do. God is faithful. His promises reign true. He separates the water, and God's people walk across, right, on dry ground. They get all the way across. And then God tells them after, he's like, hey, get some leaders from the 12 tribes. Get them, tell them each to get a stone. Build an altar. Build an altar here to remember what I've done. Build an altar here to remember that you crossed on dry ground. That I'm faithful, that I made a way, that my promises will always hold true. That's one example of many. We need to build altars in our lives. We need to be able to have things that we can look back on when, when, when the going gets tough and the journey ahead looks like I'm, start, I'm starting to convince myself, maybe I'm not qualified. Maybe, maybe I should just stop. Maybe I should step out instead of stay in whatever it is that's trying to convince us to step out of what God has for us. We can look back and go, hold on. He was faithful. He was faithful there. He was faithful there and there and there and there and there. He can be faithful again. Amen. He will be faithful again because that is who he is. That is the kind of good God he is. That is how he provides God, give me the strength to stay in it because I can see that you've been faithful, God, in my life, in their life. Build the altars, right? Another big reason for this, I think it's so important, is not just, not just for us looking and seeing God's faithfulness alone in the big picture, but looking at how God has been faithful to us in our growth, right? I started way back here as somebody who struggled with a ton of things, right? And through God's faithfulness, I've I've experienced freedom and freedom and freedom and freedom after freedom after freedom, right? I was addicted to pornography, freedom. I was addicted, or I was, I was an angry person. I struggled with anger. Every, everything I said was out of anger, freedom from that. I, I, I dealt with shame and guilt, freedom from that. All these things, God said, remember that? Remember that? Look, I'm gonna hit a place where I'm gonna go, this is hard, God, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can keep moving forward. And he goes, look where you were, look where you are now. Look where I've brought you. Am I not the faithful God that I once was then and will be forever? right? It's like, what's that old country song? I ain't as good as I'm going to get, right? Come on. Tim McGraw, is that right? I don't know. No? Who is it? Somebody said Toby Keith. Keith. Is that what it is? I don't know. We can argue about it later. They're all the same. Not really. Um, (laughs) That's rude. I like country music. Well, that's another conversation, another sermon. (laughs) But I'm better than I used to be. Amen? Amen. And that matters. That's, that, that matters until it's an excuse to say I've done enough. That's not what we're saying. But to look back and go praise God because he's gotten me here and he's going to take me there. I'm better than I used to be, Lord, and that's because of you. You are a faithful, faithful, faithful God through and through. God is faithful. Point number two, another truth about God. God's guidance is unmatched. God's guidance, his provision, his direction, his voice, it's, it's unmatched. Okay, what, am I, what do I mean by this? Isaiah 58, 11. It says, And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters do not fail. The prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament tells the truth about the provision and guidance of God. There is nothing like it. Right? God's way, God's voice, God's plan, God's desire, it is all unmatched. There is no power like the power of the Almighty God. 
that he has. So what does this have to do with me staying in it? There will be thing after thing after thing that will convince you or want to convince you that it, they, you know what is going on and what is best for you. That it is the voice you should listen to. It is the guide that you should follow. And we have to say no to those things because the only voice, the only guide is Jesus. The only way we actually make it through and keep moving forward and stay in it is if we listen to his voice and his alone. We've got to have selective hearing for the voice of God because a thousand other things will say, do this, go this way, including ourselves, the enemy's voice, all kinds of stuff. This is how it should be done. And those things will lead us off the path. Those things will lead us out of the purpose that God has. So to stay in it, we need one guide, the one true king. Let his voice be the way. Amen. So my wife, Rachel, is I was just going to say that she is a killer when it comes to like design, okay? She is, man. Rachel's good at that stuff. She does a great job. Thanks, Josh. Um, <laughs> but seriously, interior, like home stuff, fashion, like Rachel knows how to make things look good, okay? That's just, she does. And so uh, we, we're a fan of doing projects at home. So whenever we do a project at home, we're going to like build an accent wall or something like that. Rachel would be like, here's what I think it needs to be. Here's what we're going to do. And for some reason, every time I'm always like, I think I have a better idea probably look better like this, right? Let's do this. That never happens, right? <laughs> so it's all Rachel's way happens. That's not because Rachel's like, I want my way, but because we get to the end and I go, she was right. <laughs> right? It looks beautiful. It looks wonderful. And if I don't recognize it at first and I would like let the whole, like the, the, the decision linger of like, yeah, I think mine would have looked better. Somebody else would come into our house and go, Rachel, that looks great. And I'm like, dang, they were right. You know, <laughs> Rachel's right. She knew what she was doing. Point being, let the experts be the experts, Right? How many things in our lives do we like to come in and go, this is how it should be, including our walk with the Lord? God, I've, I figured it out. I've learned enough life to be able to lead it from here, right? It's like, I don't think so, man. I think I've got a lot to learn, always. I think this old dog has a lot of new tricks and needs to learn, Lord. Keep teaching me. Keep showing me what is the way, Father. How should this look, Father? Because I am not the expert. You are you know what design is going to work perfectly for this living room, you know? You know what's going to make it best, God, because you are the best. Everything about you is perfect and good, so why would I not choose your way and your guidance, your voice over every other one? You'll never let me down. And again, this is huge for those of us who, who are on the other side of the pendulum we talked about. And for us, the struggle is not, I feel disqualified, but more I'm maybe in my mind a little overqualified and saying I've done enough. I fit that place of enough, Lord. So now I'm just waiting for the end and then I'll say that thing that Paul said. But we forget, like Paul said in Philippians, he who began a good work in you will carry it out onto completion until the day of Christ Jesus, not until the day of Ricky Bustos and when he says, right? It's when Jesus says, you've done it. It's time to come home. You've done it. So for me, it's time to step back and go, all right, Lord, what do you have for me? Because if I still got, I got breath in my lungs, yeah, I'm breathing. I got, there it is. What do you have for me, Jesus? What more do you have for me? What can I be doing next for you? How can I serve you, my king? Because it's not over. There's work to be done. There's change and growth still to happen. God may want me to, go, maybe, maybe it's not serving in this capacity at the church the way I was, but maybe my family needs me to serve in a different capacity at home. Maybe they didn't love my kids and my wife in a different way. And God's saying, hey, you, yeah, you've done this stuff, but don't get caught up in it. Maybe it's more here. Maybe I have a friend who needs me to be spending time with him and loving on them. And that's where my folks, God will shift our purpose for us. He, he's got a purpose laid out, but it may shift and look different to us in different seasons because that's how he works. He's mighty and he knows what he's doing. So I'm called to go, what do you have, Lord? Guide me because your voice is the only one. Help me to stay in it. Point number three, God's forgiveness is total. Hebrews 8, 12 says, and I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remember their sins. Hallelujah. All right. So we were, we, when we read this, I think sometimes there's confusion too. We're like, all right, so cool thing. I do something wrong. No worries. God has amnesia. It goes away, right? He doesn't remember it. It's like, no, 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 no. I don't think that's what happens. And then like we get to judgment day and he's like, wait, what did they? Whoa. You know what I mean? They really messed up. I don't think that's how that works, right? I believe that God remembers our stuff, but what I believe he does is he doesn't hold it against us. God knows what we've done. God sees all things, amen? amen. He knows all things, amen? amen? But God loves us so much that when he comes to us and he knows what we've done, he says, hey, I'm not gonna hold this against you. I love you. Here's forgiveness. Here's grace. Here is mercy. Now let's go. This wasn't it, and this has gotta change. Let me change it. Let's go. 
I love you. I forgive you. Again, here's grace. Here's mercy. Let's go. Stay in it with me. Let's keep moving forward. But we struggle with that. We have this tendency, and sometimes we have this idea that maybe God is clinging to the brokenness, which in turn is like, maybe I should cling to my brokenness. Maybe my sin is all that I should see. And that leads us so astray, so focused and so feeling so condemned and shamed and guilty, and that's not where God wants us to be. That is not who he is. So I, we, uh, at our house, another little project illustration for you. When we first moved in this house we're currently in, um, the previous owner was, was remodeling, and, and they had taken up all the old flooring, and we're going to put new stuff in. So we got to lay new flooring in our house, which is exciting. We're like, oh, we get to pick flooring, and all that's something new for us. And so we were pumped. Uh, and we decided we can do it. We got to lay new flooring. We got it, right? So did it. Is it perfect? No. <laughs> right? If you come over to my house, don't look at the floor too hard, okay? Because there's little pieces where, again, first time ever for me laying flooring, and it was like tongue and groove, kind of hardwood laminate stuff, and it's like, it was a whole learning process, and in everything that we were doing, Tanner was there to help me. We got it done. It was great, yeah, but there was a lot of errors in the midst, right? And for a while, if I'm being totally honest, every time I would walk out and like look at the floor, I'd go, you suck. (laughs) This is terrible, not worthy to be in a house, right? And just like hated on the floor because of all the imperfections and was like, I'm really not good at this whole flooring thing. And I started to disqualify myself again. Eventually one day I came to it and go, you know what? This is good. Not like, ah, it's fine. But like, no, praise God. I learned something new. I grew in this season. It's not perfect. There's some, there's some brokenness there, but there's a floor. Something was done. I grew and moved forward. Praise God. That should be us in our journey with Jesus, right? I don't mean that in a boastful way of like, look what I'm saying, like all of us, myself included. To not look at my sin and my brokenness and go, oh man, it's so bad, you suck. But to go, all right, this is rough. This is an issue. Here you go, Lord, because you're good. And because you're good and because you've been here this whole time, it's all good. We're gonna keep moving forward. Not get stuck on the brokenness, not brokenness and not let it be all that we see, Jesus, but let you and your goodness be everything and what you wanna do and what you've already done and what, what I've learned and grown in already, Jesus. Help me to not get stuck on those moments where I, I fall short, but to remember what you have for me. Give me strength. Help me to keep moving forward and see the bigger picture of all that is good so that I can stay in it with you. Last thing, we've got to stay in it, right? Stay in this journey. Stay in this calling. Stay in the ministry that God has called you to. Follow him, follow him, follow him, right? As, as uh, Pastor Josh has said a few times um, in this series and before, um, God expects Jesus' followers to truly follow Jesus, right? To really seek him and to know him. Ephesians 1, 9 through 10 says, God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything in heaven and on earth. The plan of God, his desire for us and all things that he's created to bring them to completion, to bring them to wholeness, to bring them together under the authority and the power of Jesus Christ, under what he's done for us on the cross and for all eternity everything on heaven and on earth. God has revealed his ultimate plan for us through Jesus. Total fulfillment. And one day I will go and I will spend eternity with my Savior. And he, he will bring perfection and he will wipe away every tear again. He will do all those things. But until then, I'm here on this earth and he's called me. He's laid out a plan and a purpose that he will bring to completion. But right now I'm in the midst of that plan and purpose. And he's calling me to walk it out. He's calling me to stay in it. And so one last thing I want to remind you as we wrap up this whole series, as we look at this whole picture of what God is doing, is we have to follow and seek. Follow and seek. Again, follow Jesus, truly follow him. And what that looks like is constantly seeking his face, constantly seeking time with him, constantly seeking his will for my life, his plan. If things are different, again, some some stuff may shift. I might go, I think I've done a pretty good job. Maybe I'll just chill. It's like, what do you have for me next, Lord? Let me seek you, God. Let me seek your way for my life. What do you have with me? With every season, with every breath left in my lungs, what do you have for me, Lord? Seek his voice. 
Seek time with him, his strength, his forgiveness, his grace, his power, his faithfulness, him. Seek Jesus so that I might hit the end of this short piece of eternity that I'm currently in. And when I hit the end, I too will stand with confidence, not in myself, but in the God of all good things, in the God of grace, in the God of my salvation. And I will say, I've done it, Lord. Because of you, I've ran the race, I've fought the good fight, I've kept the faith. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? Amen. Yes, stand up. We're going to